Welcome to another installment of Fighting for the Faith. My name is Chris Rosebro. I am your servant in Jesus Christ. This is the channel that compares what people are saying in the name of God to the Word of God. Now, if you've ever heard somebody use the story of Elijah, you know how he returns to Mount uh, to to Horeb, uh, which is Mount Sinai, and there he goes into a cave, and you know he's seeking God, and then. God comes, you know, there's there's a th there's like fire and an earthquake and God wasn't in the earthquake or the fire. And then God talks to him in a still small voice or a low whisper. And they were saying, and this is how you hear the word of God. Yeah, go ahead and hit the subscribe button down below. Don't forget to like the video, ring the bell so you can be notified when we update the channel. It'll also help you when we play Prophecy Bingo. Yeah, the whole still small voice, low whisper thingy in Elijah, uh, in the story of Elijah in 1 Kings 19, has nothing to do with you hearing the voice of God. We'll talk about that in this installment. So let me set this up. We're heading down back to Vu Church, and we're going to be listening to Don Cherie Wilkerson. Mm -hmm. And um, th in fact, let me pull this up. Uh, let's uh, let's do this. And, uh, it, and the name of the video is um, Hearing God's Voice When Life is Too Loud. Hearing God's Voice When Life is Too Loud. And we're going to note there's something really ironic about this particular video. Okay? In this particular teaching, we'll point that out along the way. So let's get to it, shall we? Here we go. Today, we've kicked off this brand new collection on Hearing God's Voice. I don't think there's anyone in this room who would say, I don't want to hear God's voice. In fact, I think that hearing God's voice is a pursuit of our lives even before we meet Jesus, that all of us are seeking to know why we're here. All right. I got to point out the irony like up front. Okay. The full teaching on this is in the video that we recently did. And the name of the title is, Was Jesus a Feminist? Was Jesus a Feminist? We'll put the link, hang on a second here. Yeah, we'll put the link up here so that you can uh, you can go and watch that uh, at your leisure. But uh, I'll give you a brief uh, summary of just a particular text. The whole teaching's on the, on the other video. But, uh, it, yeah, I didn't expect to get to this this quick. I just, you know. <sighs> All right, so duplicate tab. We're going to head over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Now, so let me show you this again real quick. There's Don Cherie Wilkerson, a woman preaching a sermon during a church service on hearing the voice of God. Okay. I would note that Don Cherie Wilkerson would most likely affirm that the Bible is a place where we can go to hear the voice of God. I don't think she would say it was the only place, but she would acknowledge that, well, God's voice is speaking to us in the Scriptures. This is most certainly true. So 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33 says, As in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches. For they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says, if there's anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or was it from you that the word of God came? Or are you the only ones it's reached? If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he's not recognized. So let's kind of just put it out there. Number one, the voice of God is heard in the written word, in the Bible. And the voice of God in the scripture says that women are to remain silent in the church. They are not to have authority over a man. So the irony here is, is that Don Cherie Wilkerson preaching a sermon in a church, defying the written word of God, which we recognize as the voice of God. In fact, Paul says, if anyone thinks that he's a prophet or spiritual, he needs to acknowledge the things I'm writing to you are a command of the Lord. The, uh, yeah, God said so. The Lord said so. If anyone doesn't recognize that, he or I would say even she is not recognized. Okay, this is a command of the Lord. 
She's breaking the command of the Lord. That's the irony here. All right, so all that being said, let's get on with the teaching, shall we? Because you're going to note she's going to twist two passages, two texts, in talking about hearing the voice of God while disobeying the voice of God. Yeah, nothing good happens when you disobey the voice of God. I'm just saying. What this is all about. And as we gather around this topic, I really think that the next four weeks are going to be instrumental in your faith, instrumental in your future. I think that God's going to deposit some things that you're going to carry into every season of your life moving forward. Do you believe that today? I, I want to hear God's voice like never before. Start with the Bible. Start with 1 Corinthians 14. And so as we start this... And then go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. ...collection together. If you have your Bibles, why don't you turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 11. We're going to read just an excerpt of the life of a prophet named Elijah and an encounter he has with the presence of God. An encounter he has with the presence of God. All right, we're going to go take a look at the text first because I'm likely to blow up. First, uh, First Kings chapter 19. This is right after Elijah wins the big showdown, or should I say Yahweh wins the big showdown on Mount Carmel. Remember the Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel? You know, big showdown, duel to the death, if you would, you know. You, you know, two animals are going to be sacrificed. The prophets of Baal are going to call on their God. And, the, and Elijah is going to call on his God, the God who answers by fire. He is God. And wouldn't you know it, Baal wasn't home because he's a false God. And, God and, and, and Elijah calls upon Yahweh, and Yahweh answers him with fire and consumes the uh, sacrifice, everyone shouts out, Yahweh, he's God, Yahweh, he's God. And then the prophets of Baal are all put to death. And of course, the, these prophets of Baal were sanctioned by the government of Israel of Samaria, the uh, northern kingdom. And, um, <laughs> and uh, Queen Jezebel was the person behind them. So here's what it says in 1 Kings 19, uh, like immediately after the victory on Mount Carmel. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. And then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and, and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. So then he was afraid. He rose and ran for his life. Uh, you know, And uh, came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left a servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It's enough now, O, y o Yahweh, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree, and behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of Yahweh came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he rose and he ate and he drank and he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, to the mount of God. And there he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of Yahweh came to him and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for Yahweh, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've thrown down your altars. They've killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I, am left, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before Yahweh. And behold, Yahweh passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before Yahweh. But Yahweh was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake. And Yahweh was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire, but Yahweh was not in the fire, and after the fire the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak, and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for Yahweh, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I... 
even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And Yahweh said to him, You go and return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria, and Jehu the son of Nimshi you shall anoint to be the king over Israel, and Elisha the son of Shaphat of Abel, Abel Mehaloah you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death, and the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, every mouth that has not kissed him. So he departed from there and found Elisha the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him, and he was with the 12th. Now I won't read the rest of the story, but you get the idea. That's the account. So Jezebel threatens to kill Elijah, Elijah's afraid, he flees for his life, he goes to Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, and God meets with him there, and he registers his complaint. They, they, they have killed all your prophets, I'm the only one left, and God says, all right, So, and he asked to die. He says, that's it, I'm done, Lord, I'm done, and the, and the Lord says, okay, you're done. Uh, you, go, you go anoint Elisha to, to be the prophet in your place. And just a couple short chapters from this chapter, Elijah's going to be taken up to heaven in a chariot of fire. You know, so you kind of get the idea. Now, a little bit of a note here. Here's an important distinction. When we read a historical narrative, oftentimes, most of the time, historical narratives are descriptive texts of what happened. They are not a uh, prescriptive text as far as what you are to do. Now, there are oftentimes within historical narratives prescriptions that we are to obey and follow, but that you can t you can clearly see that. Now, note, this is a descriptive text, not a prescriptive text. We know from this account that Eli Elijah, you know, that God did speak to him in a low whisper. But nowhere are we told that God will speak to us as individuals in a low whisper or a still small voice. This is not a prescriptive text about how to hear the voice of God, like not at all. I'll give you another example that kind of makes the point. In the book of Judges, in fact, let me see if I could find this really quick, um, Ehud, Ehud in the book of Judges, uh, yeah, here we go. Um, yeah, here we go. All right, so Judges chapter 3. In fact, let me just add some context to this. The people of Israel cried out to Yahweh, and Yahweh raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. The people of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab, and Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges, a cubit in length, and he bound it on his right thigh under his clothes, and he presented tribute to Eglon, the king of Moab. Now, Eglon was a very fat man, and when Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute, but he himself turned back at the, idol, uh, at the idols near Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king, and he commanded silence. And all the attendants went out from his presence, and Ehud came to him as he was sitting alone in, in, in his cool roof chamber, and Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And he rose from his seat, and Ehud reached with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, thrust it into his belly, and the hilt also went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not pull the sword out of his belly, and the dung came out, and Ehud went out into the porch and closed the door of the roof chamber behind him and locked them. Now, why did I read this? All right, so this is a descriptive text. If somebody were to get up in in you know in a pulpit and say, "Now Ehud, he was he was raised up by the Lord," and you'll notice that he was engaging in concealed carry, he had a weapon. Now, back, granted, you know it wasn't a firearm, but you know the sword was the ancient world's version of a firearm. So we know then from this text that God wants us all. To, to be people who conceal carry firearms to protect ourselves, if somebody did that, they would be twisting this text. 
This text has nothing to do with whether or not you should get a concealed carry permit and carry a firearm in your state. That has like nothing to do with it at all. This is a descriptive text, not a prescription for you to carry a firearm. You get the idea? So in the same way, then, uh, what we just read out from uh, from the book of uh, from the book of uh, First Kings, uh, chapter nineteen. Uh, w- w- in the same way, then, First Kings nineteen has n- it's a descriptive text, not a prescription on how to hear the voice of God. And anybody who says, "Oh, the Lord's going to speak to you in a still small voice," is taking a descriptive text, turning into a prescription when there is no warrant for it to be a prescription at all. And I would remind people who do such things that Peter himself in 2 Peter tells us as he's getting ready to go to his own death, and he will be crucified upside down, as he's getting to uh, go to his own death, he re- he reminds people about the Word of God. Now, Peter writes in 2 Peter 1, "...we did not follow cleverly devised myths." when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And this is talking, you know, he's referring back to the the, the Mount of Transfiguration. We ourselves, we heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. Now note, he's here talking about we actually heard the voice of the Father. All right, we heard it. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as a lamp to in a shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. And here the word for Scripture, graphe, graphe, this is talking about the written word. No prophecy of Scripture, of the writing, comes from someone's own interpretation. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of men, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So you'll note then that Peter himself, as he's getting ready to go to his grave, as he's getting ready to be martyred, he's reminding the church that the place we go to hear the voice of God is where? In the written Word of God. That's his point. So all of that's been said. Let's go back to Don Cherie Wilkerson, who ironically is disobeying the voice of God by delivering the message that she's delivering about hearing the voice of God. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is, this is just messed up on so many levels. And if you don't have your Bibles, it'll be on the screens. But this is what it says, verse 11. It says, The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face, went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And as we kick off this collection, so, note, totally out of context. We applied our three rules to sound biblical exegesis already, which are context, context, context. And all she's focusing is on the encounter. No, we don't know why the encounter is taking place. We don't know what, you know, the what's the reason why Elijah is at Mount is at Mount Sinai. We don't know any of that. We just and the Lord spoke to him in a in a whisper. You see. And that's, that's all she cares about because she's going to turn this into a prescriptive text when it's not. Hearing God's voice. I want to talk to you for the next few minutes on this thought, when life is too loud. Will you pray with me tonight? Lord, thank you so much for this moment. Thank you for every man, every woman in this room. Thank you, God, that we've come to hear you speak. So Lord, I pray that your word would come alive to us. I pray that community would sharpen us. 
God, I pray that you would work in every one of our hearts in a real way. We love you. We thank you for this night. We thank you for our city. We thank you for this family. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all of you church said, amen, amen. Well, here we are starting this brand new collection. And as I'm preaching, I want you to know that I'm not preaching alone. If you can't tell, there's actually two people preaching the message today. Are you with me? Hey, buddy. He can actually hear me right now. He can hear you right now. We are five weeks away from meeting our miracle, our little guy. But you know what else is cool is that today I've been preaching five times. So I'm going five that's five times too many. Yeah, whether you're with child or not, women are forbidden by the Lord to preach and to exercise authority over man in church. And yet she's preaching about hearing the voice of God. Again, the irony here is just bizarre. For five, y'all. What do you think? Let's go for it together. I think we've got one more in us. Five for five. And... A year and a half ago, we had our first child, our son, Wyatt Wesley Wilkers, and he was down here at the altar, like worshiping his heart out at the beginning of this service. But you may not know our story. I never get tired of telling our story. I'll tell it for the rest of my life because it's our story, the reality of God inserting his grace and love into our circumstance like only he can you know we we had been married for 13 years for 12 of those years well he was married he was born a year ago but for 8 of those years we were asking god to give us a child and for eight of those years, it seemed impossible that, that maybe it wasn't gonna actually happen. And I never get tired of telling people the story because here's the deal. A waiting season is not a wasted season. And I know that there are countless people in this room that you're in a waiting season and you're wondering when you're gonna get out of your waiting season and when you're gonna hear God speak. But let me tell you from experience that God actually speaks in waiting seasons. That so those of you in a waiting season, good news. Don Cherie Wilkerson, from her own experience, knows that, that during waiting seasons, that's when God really speaks. No text says this. You can hear his voice loud and clear. Can anybody testify tonight that God is close while you wait? So that's just a side story. But what I want to tell you is this, a year and a half ago when I gave birth to Wyatt Wesley Wilkerson, a lot of our life changed forever. And it changed in the best way possible. And we're learning every single day. I learn more than he is learning. I can promise you that. But one of the things that we learned is there are a few key pieces of gear in your home that make life a lot easier. You don't need all of it, but there's a few things that I, I just think they are God ideas that they are gifts from heaven. And one of those things is the sound machine. Anybody love a good sound machine? You're going, Don Shree, what's the sound machine? The sound machine is this little box I plug in in my son's room every time he goes to sleep. And it fills the room with the loudest but most peaceful sounds. And it blocks out all the voices around him so he can't hear anybody talking in the hallway or a door slamming or any conversations that would wake him. And that sound machine actually lulls him to sleep and keeps him asleep. And let me tell you, when my son sleeps, it's a good thing. <laughs> because when my son sleeps, it means that I sleep. And when I sleep, it's better for everyone in <laughs> my life. And sometimes I get so used to that sound machine that I've, I'm playing it multiple times in the day that I can wake up in the morning and I'm changing his diaper and I'm trying to get out the door and I'm trying to get food on the table for him. And I get so caught up in the routine that I don't realize that I've left the sound machine on far beyond the time that it is actually used. And I can walk back in the room and this. Note, this text is not explained and made clear by her talking about the sound machine that she uses to help her infant child to sleep better. 
the sound machine is still roaring with all of this noise. And I have to go over and I have to actually turn it off because that sound machine has been filling my house with the waves crashing upon the cliffs and the wind blowing romantically through the trees. But I don't need that sound anymore. It's time to turn it off. Can I tell you that life is one big sound machine? That life fills our ears and our lives with so much noise. And you know what? It's not all bad noise. A lot of it's beautiful. A lot of it can lull us to sleep and make us miss out on the whisper of heaven. But it's... Yeah, the noise of your life is causing you to miss out on hearing the whisper of heaven. I told you she was turning this into a uh, prescriptive text. It's not. God isn't whispering to you. And I want you to consider just how ridiculous this is. So there we are, going about our daily business, and God's talking to us, but we can't hear him. I, you know, I always like to kind of do it you know, this way. We use the voice of the Holy Spirit like this. Hello, this is the voice of the Holy Spirit, and I'm, o- I'm only able to whisper right now. Are you listening? Hello? Can you hear me? Oh, I guess you're too busy watching television, and you can't hear my whisper voice. No. When has God spoken to a person and that person not heard. When has God communicated and a person was unable to hear and God's communication went thwarted? In fact, I would even argue this. Jesus, when he came across people who were physically deaf, physically deaf, he healed them and they were able to hear. So when God communicates, it doesn't matter if the person's deaf or busy or preoccupied. When God speaks, he will be heard. To believe otherwise is to say that God is incapable of having people hear him when he's communicating. Yeah, I want you to think about that. I mean, so I was so busy, I missed the whisper of God. Oh, bummer for God. All right, let me back this up just a smidge. I want you to hear it again. It's not all bad noise. A lot of it's beautiful. A lot of it can lull us to sleep and make us miss out on the whisper of heaven. But it's time for us that when life gets too loud, we know where the off button is to the sound machine of life. Is anybody with me today that you are desperate for the noise to stop and for the Where is the off button to the sound machine of life? I'd like to know where that is. The whisper of heaven to begin. Well, I'm with you. And that's why we're taking the time over the next few weeks to discuss how we together and individually can hear God's voice. You see, when life gets too loud, often instead of turning the music off, instead of turning the noise off, instead of shutting down the other voices and seeking to hear God speak, we revert to looking for God. What? (laughs) What? But that's not the way that God speaks. The scriptures tell us that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Oh, this is so bad. All right, so I'm going to ask you this question before we get to Romans chapter 10, because that's the verse she just twisted. Does Romans chapter 10, when it says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ, is that referring to somebody who is preaching and proclaiming the Bible, or God coming and whispering to you? Which is it? Yeah, well, let's take a look at the text. Romans chapter 10. Let me get there real quick. Romans chapter 10. And in this uh, text, I want you to listen to what Paul uh, says here. I'll start at verse 10. Again, three rules for sound biblical exegesis our context, context, and context. So here's what it says, starting at verse 10. With the heart one believes and is justified. With the mouth one confesses and is saved. For Scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him, 
for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So you know, this is in the context then of what? Salvation. This is going to be in the bigger context then of evangelism. So Paul then asks the question, how then will they call on him, you know, and be saved, whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Mm -hmm. And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Uh huh. So note the context. So somebody is sent. They bring the good news. They preach the gospel. Christ has bled and died for your sins. Repent. Be forgiven. Right? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who's believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. The word of Christ is the gospel, the good news. And that's what's being referred to here. So she just took Romans 10, 17, and made it appear by ripping it out of context that it's this is talking about faith coming by God whispering to you. That's not what this text is about at all. So now she's, she's twisted, 1 Kings 19, She's twisted Romans 10, 17, while disobeying 1 Corinthians 14. You, you, you see what's going on here? Let me back this up and listen again what she's going to do. She'll talk a little bit more about faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. But that's not the way that God speaks. The scriptures tell us that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And we can't fall for the trick that every time life gets too busy, that we start to use our own natural sight to try to make our own path. Oh no, friend, it's by hearing the word of God because it's his word that's a light to our feet, that it's a lamp to our path. God's written word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, not a whisper. How many of you believe today that he's waiting to speak specifically, intentionally to you? When life gets too loud, it's time to listen. It's an epidemic in 2019 because you and I, it's so easy to expect others to listen for us. I just listened to a great podcast and just heard that awesome sermon. I just read that book and friend, all of that is wonderful, but in and of itself, it is not enough to satisfy your soul. You need to be able to turn the sound machine off and hear the whisper of heaven. It says no text anywhere, including 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, Romans 10, and 1 Kings 19. Wow, this is, this is frighteningly awful. Frighteningly awful. I want to throw another text in here because, uh, let's see, 2 Timothy chapter 3 tells us something quite important, okay? Paul, writing to young Pastor Timothy, says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, the grammata, the writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God. Yes, it is. And it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every, all good works, not some, every one of them. Note, Paul, as he's approaching the end of his life, is pointing young Pastor Timothy to what? Not a whisper, but the written word of God. And then he says, I, I, So I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who's to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. This is talking about the written word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And I would argue that's what we're looking at here. Don Cherie Wilkerson 
is she's not teaching the truth. She's not teaching what's in accord with sound doctrine, and she's not practicing sound doctrine ev- either. By, by her actions, she is denying that God has spoken in 1 Corinthians 14 and 2 Timothy 2. Mm-hmm. And the people that sit there going, wow, this is great, wow, wow, this is truth, amen. She's twisting God's word rather than rightly teaching it, and she's disobeying it in your presence to your face. Within your heart, 1 Kings chapter 19, we read the story of a man who was ordinary, just like me, just like you, but he experiences the presence of God in a supernatural way. He experiences the presence of God. You think that's the point of the text? Elijah the prophet, he's in a desperate time in his life. It's not a happy season in his life. Indeed. If you read the scriptures before. Yeah, why didn't you read the scriptures before? He's desperate for God. He's desperate for God to lift his head and give him hope to continue living. And we read of this encounter with the presence of God that first the wind comes, then the earthquake comes, then the fire comes, all the places that you would expect the creator of the world to make his voice known. But that's not where the voice of God is found. Again, she's taking a descriptive text and trying to turn it into a prescription for how to hear the voice of God, and it's not. We read that after all of these displays of power, that God actually makes himself known in the whisper. Why would the creator of the universe want for his voice to be heard through a whisper? The text doesn't say. What is the definition of whisper? Whisper means to speak very softly, using one's breath without your vocal cords, especially for the sake of privacy. When I use that word breath in the definition of whisper, automatically, you know what it brings to mind? The Genesis account. It brings to mind that our God spoke this world into existence, that with a whisper, with his very breath, that as he breathed, the world came into existence. And God wasn't whispering. In Genesis 1, God did not go, let there be light. And then there was light. God didn't do it that way. God said, let there be light. It doesn't say he whispered. It said, he said, let there be light. And continues to evolve and be sustained by that breath that was spoken so long ago. So when we say it's just a whisper, oh friend, it's anything but. God's never whispered to me either. Just. Because the whisper of God is everything that we seek, amen? No, I I seek the voice of God, and I find it in the written word of God. That's where I know it is, is to be heard. Paul points me to it. Jesus points me to it. Peter points me to it. In fact, all the prophets say, thus saith the Lord. So I know that in the scriptures, I have the voice of God. In the account that you're reading... God spoke to Elijah, and he's the only one he did that to, in a, in a low whisper. It does not say he's going to do that to me or that I should seek God to speak to me in a low whisper. His whisper brings life. His whisper can bring the God dream about. His, whi- His whisper can bring the God dream about? What is that? His whisper can resurrect the dead things in your life. His- <sighs> His whisper can resurrect the dead things in my life. Yeah, I think you need his whisper to resurrect your dead church. His whisper can heal your heart. His whisper can bring healing from the things that are holding your bondage. His whisper. His whisper, she's shouting. Creates that which you and I could never dream of creating within our lives. His whisper. Yeah, uh, 1 Kings 19 doesn't say any of this. Is what we seek, and even today. No, I don't seek his whisper. Nowhere in Scripture am I told to seek God's whisper. He seeks to whisper into your heart of hearts. No, he doesn't. Hang on, I back that up. Listen again. Whisper is what we seek, and even today, he seeks to whisper into your heart of hearts. 
No text says that God seeks to whisper into my heart of hearts. You just made that up. With exact That's not the voice of God. Exactly what you need and then empower you to go out and change the world around you. No, God is not empowering me to change the world. I, my job is not to make a difference or to change the world. My job is to make disciples, baptizing, teaching all that Christ has commanded. Yeah, it's written. But it starts by hearing God's voice. Clearly you haven't. Yeah, I think you get the point. You know, this, there's no way to rescue this message. It is so far off track. Yeah, you, you want to hear God's voice? It's there in the written word. God speaks through his word. His word is theonoustos. It is God breathed. Hebrew says God's word is living and active. The psalm says God's word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Peter says that we have the prophetic word even more sure than the voice that he heard of the Father. The, the, the written word, the prophetic word. You want to hear God's voice? Open your Bible. If you want to hear God's voice audibly, read your Bible out loud. Don Cherie Wilkerson, by the very act that she was engaging in, shows by her actions that she has not heard the voice of God in the scriptures because she is openly disobeying it. And then she twisted God's word and made it void. So who are you going to believe? Don Cherie Wilkerson or the written word of God? Those are your choices. Hopefully you found this helpful. If you did, all the information on how you can share the video is down below in the description. And as always, I like to remind you, Fighting for the Faith, we're supported by the people we serve, and that's you. So if you don't already support us by being a crew member, all the information on how to be a crew member is down below. And, and if you, you can become a crew member, support us on Patreon, or even send in a one-time contribution. Like I said, we truly can't do what we're doing here without your support, so thank you. So until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won by Jesus Christ and his vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins. Amen. Mm -hmm.